Good morning, my name is Josh from Cyclone Soz and today we're going to continue to track the Gulf of Carpentaria system because it's actually caught me off guard this morning that we're going to see this system form this week and about a day earlier than expected. We're looking at this emerging offshore from the Kakadu area over Groot Island um, by around Wednesday or so. So we're going to be seeing this develop into a tropical cyclone between Wednesday and Friday and it's looking like a Category 1 to Category 2 strength threat for locations between Weeper all the way down the Gulf of Carpentaria, Queensland, coastline and then across to Robinson River and up towards Groot Island in the Northern Territory. So there is a little bit of a uh, large area that's expected to be impacted by this tropical cyclone and then this forecast me breaking down maximum intensity uh, wind speeds and so forth and then also rainfall for Queensland because I did mention that as a possible issue in the last update that we could be seeing a significant amount of rainfall around Cairns and the Daintree Rainforest region uh, and I will be covering that in this uh, update. And if you are brand new to the channel then please do consider subscribing and also leave a like on the video while you're at it. You can see these westerly winds up in the uh, Timor Sea and Arafura Sea, I believe that's what it's called. Correct me if my pronunciation is incorrect. Uh, you can see that there is uh, quite a strong westerly flow now, especially in the lower levels, and we're starting to see this lower level rotation wrap into what looks like a low pressure area with a lot of thunderstorm activity now situated between Darwin and Catherine. And I can confirm this by wind observations. We can see these westerly winds uh, coming ashore between Darwin and then down towards, I guess, Daly River and across here on the northern parts of the Northern Territory coastline. But we're seeing these easterly winds around Catherine and what's that Douglas River there we're seeing these strong easterly winds there is a low pressure system here or located maybe about here where all this thunderstorm activity is and it's a lot tighter uh, than what I initially thought now what we're going to be looking at is for this low pressure system if I take the wind forecast back to right now what we're looking at is for this low pressure system located here to jog across the Northern Territory and what we're going to be seeing over the coming couple of days into Tuesday we're going to see this low pressure system probably strengthen a little bit, but it's not going to do too much until about Wednesday afternoon when it emerges into the Gulf of Carpentaria as a weak tropical low, moving over Groot Island, and then by Thursday afternoon, we start to see it really organise itself and becomes a tropical cyclone by Friday. Now, the Eastern Reef has this overwater as a tropical cyclone for all of about 12 hours before it makes landfall on top of Robinson River uh, in this part of the Northern Territory, very close to the Northern Territory Queensland border, and bringing cyclone winds as far away as Mornington Island and then I would say Burketown as well, Burketown. Uh, over in uh, parts of far northwestern Queensland. We'll be seeing these cyclone wind gusts as well extend significantly further inland and all the way up towards Weeper and maybe even Thursday Island as well. Nullman Boy should also get some pretty strong um, cyclonic wind gusts maybe up towards 80 kilometres an hour uh, in those thunder showers uh, on Friday and into Saturday. But these strong winds will also wrap uh, quite a far way inland where we'll be seeing wind gusts approaching 70 to 80 kilometres an hour for quite a few locations in far north Queensland and all also into the Northern Territory as well. And then as this system moves inland on Saturday, it should weaken substantially, moving over Elliot and Tennant Creek, still delivering cyclone wind gusts and probably a substantial amount of rainfall next weekend. And then it moves into Western Australia in a very similar fashion to, I believe it was a tropical low up here. I think it just wrapped itself up um, in the Bonaparte Gulf and then just sort of moved inland over the Northern Territory. That was one that I hyped up to become a strong cyclone in the Gulf of Carpentaria about a month ago, but it really didn't do anything. And the models got that completely wrong, but I reckon the models are going to get this system bang on. There's nothing saying that this is going to be a bad forecast, and it's close enough now where we can say with a high degree of certainty what's going to happen. I'll be telling what locations should be preparing a little bit later on in this video. Now I'm going to roll this back to Monday today uh, on the GFS forecast model and see what's going on here. You can see the GFS pulling the system very slowly out of the Northern Territory through Monday and Tuesday. It doesn't call for too much in the way of strengthening, but none of the forecast models call for any degree of strengthening until about Wednesday evening or into Thursday morning when it emerges into the Gulf of Carpentaria, becoming a cyclone by Thursday morning about 12 hours before the Eastern Rivia forecast model did, and it holds cyclone status for about 24 to 30 or maybe even 36 hours before it makes landfall about 20 kilometers up the coast where the Eastern Reef model initially had the landfall. So very good model congruency right now between the GFS and the Eastern Reef. And I've been talking time and time again about how we want to see model congruency because that means that we're looking at an easier forecast to make and a higher degree of certainty with said forecast. And yeah, you can see the GFS calling for this very weak system to be making landfall. I wouldn't be de um, de deceived by this forecast from the GFS. The 
GFS has a big tendency to underestimate on uh, tropical cyclone wind speeds because it is a lower resolution forecast model. And what I like to do to get an accurate picture of peak wind speeds from the GFS model is just flick it over to wind gusts and see what the wind gusts are and interpolate those as peak wind speeds. So we're looking at a landfall as a very weak category one tropical cyclone with peak wind speeds probably of around 70 to 80 kilometers an hour. It really isn't anything more than a bunch of gusty thunderstorms up here at this point. So it's going to be the rainfall threat uh, that really talks here. And considering this is an incredibly remote part of not just Australia, but the world, uh, where we might only be seeing maybe five to 10,000 people impacted by this tropical low. Um, and for a tropical low impacting the entirety of the Gulf of Carpentaria, it's a lot of land to be uh, inhabited by not a lot of people. So it's not a huge population threat right now. Uh, but again, if it does swing itself a little bit further over towards the east, which is still reasonably possible, we could be seeing a substantially higher amount of rainfall for parts of Queensland, which are already expecting quite a lot of rainfall as we get into later this week and into early next week. And with this, with the passage of this system. Now, by the way, if it does get named, it will get the name of Lincoln. That's the next name on the Australian region naming list. So Tropical Cyclone Lincoln will probably end up uh, materializing out of this system and if it doesn't get named Tropical Cyclone Lincoln or it doesn't get upgraded to Tropical Cyclone status, it will likely still have cyclone winds. But the Bureau of Meteorology has a rule where the storm has to have three quarters of it uh, of its uh, area covered by gale force winds. I think it's a bit of a crazy rule because you can have a really powerful tropical cyclone that actually doesn't meet those standards and uh, it really just delays the naming process and it catches people off guard so I don't like the procedure that they have but it's something that we've got to roll with with the Australian region uh, and yeah it's just a kind of a fact of life really. Now the GFS has been for the last couple of days calling for it to re-emerge in Western Australian waters and intensify very slightly there up to cyclone status again. They've since cancelled that forecast but it looks like if I'm just looking at this picture here where we're going to be seeing a low or a low pressure trough extend over the WA coastline, not only are we looking at some extreme heat developing up here in the Pilbara region where I'm talking 49 to 50 degree days next week, uh, but we could also be seeing a significant amount of tropical energy up here which will bring a lot of rainfall to the Kimberley region and we might even be seeing next next week a tropical low start to develop over Western Australia. But that's looking really long range and you're really uh, pushing um, ahead with a forecast there. So again, a lot of uncertainty and a lot of factors can change. Now, I know I discounted the Access G3 model yesterday, but it has just switched back to the Eastern Rebirth and the GFS situation, where if I was to skip through Thursday and into Friday, it's still calling for that intensification in the Gulf of Carpentaria. It actually becomes a little bit stronger than what the other forecast models are suggesting. Once again, a plausible forecast with peak winds of around 110 kilometers an hour. That's a category two tropical cyclone there. Uh, just north of Mornington Island and they're once again making that landfall in a very similar place and time. Friday evening local time, maybe around Friday midnight local time between Robinson River and the Queensland Northern Territory border uh, just towards the west of Mornington Island. It's a very plausible picture right now considering it's back on board with what the Eastern Relief model and the GFS also have to say with this tropical cyclone and yeah I reckon the access model might be one that you can get away with using. And just for fun's sake, here's a look at the Icon forecast model, which is another pretty reliable forecast model. It's a very similar picture once again. So we've got all four major models on board with a very similar situation. Now to recap the last eight minutes of Yabba in terms of forecast models, before we take a look at peak rainfall accumulations, what we're looking at here is an expected landfall Friday evening about 10 p.m. to 2 a.m. Saturday morning around Robinson River or the Queensland Northern Territory border just through here. Um, that's probably going to happen at a category one intensity. It could be on the stronger end of a category one tropical cyclone. It's not going to be a huge threat in terms of maximum winds, but I'd be expecting peak wind gusts of around 120 kilometers an hour as this system makes landfall. Now my advice here, not official advice, but my advice is for locations between Null and By down towards the Northern Territory Queensland border, prepare for cyclonic sustained winds. That's winds in excess of 65 kilometers an hour. And then for locations um, between the Queensland Northern Territory border across to Burkton, inland to Gregory, up towards Karumba, and then I reckon uh, I would be preparing for cyclonic wind gusts, where you'd be seeing peak wind gusts approaching 65 to 80 kilometers an hour. You're not likely to receive hugely strong sustained winds, but you could be seeing some pretty strong rainfall accumulations. We'll be looking at totals up towards 200 millimeters through on the Cape York Peninsula, which I'll touch on in just a second. Mornington Island might be the only outlier there where they might actually receive the strongest winds from this tropical cyclone outside of the landfall site. 
Island, where Mornington Island residents might actually be seeing up to 100 km an hour sustained winds. So just make sure that you are preparing for those conditions right now. You've got until about Thursday to prepare, maybe a little bit sooner if you're on the Northern Territory side of this system. But yeah, Thursday, your preparations should certainly be done. But don't go absolutely crazy on this cyclone. It's not likely to be significantly strong. And if we see a significant shift in the intensity forecast on around Tuesday or Wednesday, you bet I'll be advising you. So by around the Tuesday morning or Wednesday morning update, as I've been saying for the last couple of days, we'll have a very accurate picture on what's actually expected for this tropical cyclone. Now we'll take a look at rainfall accumulations to close out this video. If we'll just uh, switch it over to rainfall accumulation for the next five days. We'll look at the East Indian forecast model first. They're expecting widespread accumulations, 200 to 400 millimetres. Once again, Mornington Island and the landfall site will likely be the wettest of the locations with about three to 400 millimetres expected, maybe slightly more um, from the back end of the system. So maybe around next weekend is when we'll be seeing the worst of the rainfall come ashore. Yeah, but up to 400 or 500 hundred millimeters it's going to be a relatively wet tropical cyclone but it's not going to be anything absolutely crazy up here then again when you get into the northern territory side of this uh, storm around and, and especially inland to around Corella Creek and Gregory uh, rainfall accumulations up to two or three hundred millimeters is still a lot that's a couple of months worth of uh, rainfall up here and that could still cause some pretty significant flooding and it is likely that we see rivers pushed to their moderate or major flood alerts up here with the passage of this tropical cyclone and its remnant energy as it moves through the Northern Territory. The GFS generally a bit of a low baller in terms of rainfall accumulation, still though calling for a significant amount of rainfall around Mornington Island and also the landfall site up to four or 500 millimetres here. Uh, this white spot here is still offshore but 800 millimetres. So peak rainfall totals could be approaching five to 600 millimetres around the landfall site and also the Queensland Northern Territory border. Uh, the Access G3 model generally on the higher end of rainfall accumulations as well. You'd be looking at a significant amount of rainfall uh, four parts of Queensland, but it looks like the Northern Territory does miss out on it. Darwin actually might get a pretty wet week out of this system as well with this westerly flow, especially over the coming couple of days. You could be seeing a pretty substantial amount of rainfall there as well. But as this system makes landfall as well, you'd be looking at rainfall totals of around 100 millimetres every three hours. So six hourly rainfall accumulations could approach 150 to 200 millimetres, and you're looking at 24 hour accumulations about two to 300 millimetres. So a lot of rainfall is expected as this system makes its landfall. Um, on the Queensland side of things, especially up towards Cairns and the Daintree Rainforest as well and down towards Innisfail, still a little bit of rainfall expected, two to 300 millimetres, but it's, pale, it's paling in comparison to the forecast that we had yesterday, where we'll be seeing up towards 800 millimetres. Uh, so yeah, a significant decrease in that. And I'm gonna say that it's not a concern now for locations between Cooktown and Townsville. Still a lot of rainfall expected, but nothing to write home about and nothing that I can foresee causing some catastrophic flooding situation like Cyclone Jasper did. But yeah, that's really the look of the system right now. A lot of rainfall is expected in certain locations anywhere bordering the Gulf of Carpentaria uh, within about 50 kilometers of the coastline. Expect between two to 300 millimeters over the next week and maybe one or two locations closer to the landfall site up to four or 500 millimeters. Mornington Island expect about 400 millimeters. Weeper maybe about 300 millimeters. Nullumbi maybe about 300 millimeters as well so uh, whatever that amount of rainfall could do in terms of flooding to your location make sure you are prepared for it especially if you live close to rivers that are prone to flooding or you've got livestock close to rivers up here make sure that they're staying safe as well putting them um, in sheds if necessary uh, moving farm equipment up towards higher ground because there is still a high chance that rivers flood from a situation like this Let's take a look at weather across the nation right now for the next couple of minutes and tone things back a little bit. Central Queensland could be getting uh, a couple of thunderstorms throughout the next 10 days, I believe. Next weekend might get a little bit stormy there. Yeah, Saturday and Sunday looks like we might be seeing a couple of storms move through the area associated with a trough that could extend down the coastline. Um, but yeah, nothing too significant. Maybe this week, actually, yeah. So tonight and tomorrow, we might be seeing some pretty strong thunderstorms through central Queensland and then also in towards Wednesday and Thursday. But these storms will likely uh, move towards coastal Queensland and New South Wales by this time. But still, though, we could be seeing rainfall totals push 25 to 50 millimetres in some locations. And the closer you get to the coastline, up to maybe 100 or 120 millimetres in one or two locations as well. But apart from that, it's straight back to dry weather for Western Australia and South Australia. It's been hot and dry there. Thankfully, a little bit of reprieve to the heat 
over for Perth. Actually, Perth residents, please tell me, yesterday it was 40 degrees when I finished work, but I got outside and it felt a little bit cooler than 40 degrees. It felt maybe 32 or 34. It didn't feel as hot. Is that because of uh, the hot weather that we've been having and I've just really dialed into the hot weather? Did anyone else really feel that? Because I was curious about that. And the second that I noticed that, I was like, I'm going to ask YouTube audience that tomorrow. So Perth residents, if you did feel a little bit cooler yesterday because it wasn't as blisteringly hot as the last Last couple of days, please let me know in the comments down below or am I absolutely making this up? Um, quite a bit of rainfall also up towards the Kimberley region of Western Australia as well with the passage of the remnant energy of this tropical cyclone through the Northern Territory and into Western Australia. We could be seeing rainfall totals approach 200 millimetres for some locations and once again that could cause some pretty significant flooding. If I'm to zoom out here um, and give these colours a little bit of meaning because I know to the layman viewer it really doesn't mean much, just this massive blues, purples and greens. Um, anywhere in the blue areas above 150 millimetres and you're looking at the chance of minor flooding over the next 10 days. When you start talking about those pinks and then whites, if you were to look at the Access G3 model as well, this is where you're looking at the risk of mo uh, moderate to major flooding. But thankfully, that m the majority of that significant rainfall remains offshore. But it doesn't look like we're looking out for any significant flooding across parts of Australia just outside of the Gulf of Carpentaria over the next 10 days. It's just reserved for this tropical cyclone uh, area here. Now I'm going to have to wrap things up here. I had a late night last night. My phone's only on 1% charge and if I stop, uh, if I keep going, uh, the recording's going to stop. So thank you so much for watching this video. Uh, your support really does mean a lot to me on this channel. If you uh, are new here, then please consider subscribing and also leave a like on the video while you're at it. And if you want to show your support a little bit extra uh, way, then please do click the join button down below as well. But thank you so much for watching this video and I'll catch you all in the next storm. Goodbye.